Hi guys, welcome back. This is video five for Mathematics 1229 on the topic of vector multiplication. We looked at um, dot products in earlier videos and got a start on the cross product and just learned that one of the applications of a cross product is to allow us to calculate fairly easily the volume of a parallelogram, or sorry, the area of, of a parallelogram and the area also of a triangle. The next topic I want to talk about is kind of a, going back a little bit into something that fits into both sections 1.1 and 1.2. I'm going to talk about it now because we're about to need it. We're about to need to work with directed line segments. A directed line segment is exactly what it sounds like. So I'm going to draw a line. We'll call that line L. And on that line, I'm going to put two points. I'm going to put the point P, I'm going to put the point Q. A directed line segment would be, for example, a, a piece of that line that connects the point P to the point Q. Now, a directed line segment is going to connect well, two points on the line, and those two points could be any two points on the line, and there's directed line segments for every line. I'm just going to draw one such directed line segment for one such line for these particular points. Uh, and I'm going to give it a name. I can't call it V because it's not a vector. I can't put V with an arrow above it. But what I can do is I can say it's the vector, or the directed line segment that goes from P to Q. But what if we're given P and Q algebraically. So how to compute the directed line segment PQ? Given, I'm going to make up some numbers and I'll put them in 3D even though the picture is in, presumably in 2D. I'll make the, the points in 3D anyway. Given P, let's go 1, 2, 3 and Q, oh. let's go um, 4, 2, 1. The way that we construct the directed line segment that starts at the point P and ends at the point Q is as follows. So PQ is equal to the coordinates of the point Q. It really should be a little Q vector that goes from the origin to the point Q. I'm not going to be too picky about that. I'm just going to say what the numbers you would plug in are. So 4, 2, 1. This is, in, in truth, this is a vector subtraction. So I'm subtracting the vector 4, 2, 1, and that vector goes from the origin to the point Q, minus the vector that goes from the origin to the point P, 1, 2, 3. And what we get is we get 3, 0, minus 2. So that's how we would construct a directed line segment that goes from point P to point Q. If we translate, we can translate this directed line segment to the origin zero 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 to create a vector and I'll give that vector a name, that vector u, which is 3, comma, 0, comma, minus 2. This is a vector that is parallel to this directed line segment, and it has the same length. And we're about to need that in order to calculate the area of a shape that is defined in terms of points. This question is fairly complicated. There's a lot of pieces. There's a lot of, a lot of things we have to keep track of. The first thing 
is we're, we're gonna have to make vectors that connect these points and I want to draw a picture to explain why and I'll, I will draw the points with some accuracy one two three four I'll do one more tick box even though we don't need it one two three four five and then I'll draw in the, the coordinates one comma two is the first coordinate call that P second coordinate four comma four so there's Q and then the coordinate R three comma three I'll exaggerate it a bit. I'm going to cheat a little bit. Okay, then I'm going to the triangle. Is this? So that's the, the triangle that that is defined by the, the vertices or edge or um, corners P, R, and Q, or P, Q, and R. What we need to do in order to use the previous formula that we saw for calculating the area of the shape is to define some vectors. And we have some, we actually do have some choices to make. Uh, we need to define a vector for two of these three sides. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to define a vector that goes from the point P to the point R. But, well, to make it a vector, I have to take that and translate it to the origin. So I'm first going to compute it as a directed line segment and then translate it to the origin. And I'm also going to compute a vector from the directed line segment that connects P to Q. I might as well give these names. I'll call the second one V, and I'll call the first one U. We need to construct these vectors. So step one construct, and there I go again, call them vectors, construct the directed line segments that go from P to Q and from P to R. As a, as a little bit of a warning, if this was a question about a, a parallelogram and we had four points, when you construct your vectors, make sure that the vectors are not parallel sides. So I'll just draw a quick shape and then I'll erase it. You want your vectors, or your directed line segments, to look like this. You want one to go like this, you want one to go like that. What you don't want, so this is good, what you don't want is this. You don't want to do, there's your parallelogram. You don't want to have one vector go this way, or one directed line segment go that way, and the other one go that way. You want each directed line segment to define a distinct side. So a length for one and a width for the other. You don't want both of them to be lengths or both of them to be widths. So, just a little bit of warning about that, and there's a question in the extra homework that's attached to this note that is essentially answered by that. That's the, you know, that's the answer to the puzzle. Anyway, so let's do that first step. Let's construct the directed line segments. So we'll start with the vector U, or the directed line segment. I shouldn't call them U, U yet. I'm a bad person. I'm going to call it uh, PR. So PR using what we saw in the last slide we're going to take the point R treat it like a point vector little r with an arrow above it take the point vector little p with an arrow above it and subtract the components that are there. So R 3 comma 3 minus 1 comma 2 and we get 2 comma 1. Now we need the other one which I'm going to call PQ 
going from the point P to the point Q. That's four comma four minus one comma two, which is three comma two. So there are the two directed line segments that connect the points to define two of the three sides, which is all we need. Step two, create vectors in R3. This is another part of the trick of this question. In order to use our formulas for area, we have to have 3D vectors. We have to have three components because we're doing cross products. These directed line segments only have two components. So what are we supposed to do? Imagine a piece of paper. I don't have a piece of paper. Imagine it. Imagine a piece of paper and put those points in the piece of paper. Now pick a value for the third dimension. Pick what the Z coordinate is for those points. If your piece of paper is sitting on the desk, the Z coordinates going up and down, well, let's just treat the desk as zero. So that, that would be an assumption. We're, we don't know if the Z coordinate is actually zero. Now calculate the area that's there on the, on the paper of that shape when you put it on your desk. Now move it up a little bit, move it higher, give it a higher Z value. The area is not going to change. Give it a lower Z value, the area is not going to change. You can put anything you want for Z. It won't make any difference. It will not change the area. Putting zero is the easiest. It's going to make your life the simplest. So that's what I'm going to, I'm going to do. Um, if no third component set all third components to zero, So I'm going to give these vectors names. I'm going to say the vector u is 2 comma 1 comma 0 and the vector v is 3 comma 2 comma 0. Now we have two vectors that describe the sides of this triangle. Step 3 is to use our formula. Formula for area. So our formula is that the area is one half times the length of u cross v. So to do this next step, we have to do our cross product, u cross v. So I'll do that. So make two copies, 2, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0, 3, 2, 0. 3, 2, 0. Hide the first and last parts of this thing. So u cross v, we're going to have three components, each one a down product minus an up product. So the first down product, 1 times 0 is 0. Second down product, 0 times 3 is 0. And the last one, 2 times 2 is 4 and then subtract the up components. So subtract, subtract, subtract. 2 times 0 is 0, 0 times 2 is 0, and 3 times 1 is 3. And then we can simplify. We get 0, comma, 0, comma, 1. I'm just going to double check that by doing dot products and the dot product of this result of u cross v with, with each of u and v independently, we get zero. So it's simultaneously 90 degrees to both of these vectors. Okay, next. We're going to find the length of that vector. I find the length of u cross v. I'll put that into the calculation over here. And then we'll take that result and multiply it by a half. So this equals 1 half times the square root of 0 squared 
plus 0 squared plus 1 squared, which is 1 half times the square root of 1 squared, which is 1. So we get a final answer of 1 half for the area. An important thing is that the area is a positive quantity, and we, we did obtain that. If you were to draw this very carefully in graph paper and, and count out um, one little square as having an area of one, uh, you should be able to, like my picture is really terrible, it's, it's making it taller than the, than the triangle actually is just to exaggerate the shape, but it should come out to be convincingly close to a half, a half of a square of total, total area worth on your graph paper. Unless I made a mistake. If, let, if I made a mistake in the calculation, let me know. Okay, what else can we do with cross products? So the area of a rectangle or a parallelogram or a square, all those areas are similar in structure. They, are, they result from the multiplication, some type of multiplication, of a length and a width. Oh, how about a volume? How do you find the volume of a cube? Well, a cube, all sides the same, is you know, length to the power of three. Length times length times length. What about a box where the lengths are all different? Well, you have a length, width, and a height. Well, the volume is going to be length times width times height. So it should not come as a surprise that if we want to calculate the volume of, of a shape in 3D, whose, whose sides are defined by three different vectors, then we're going to have some type of multiplication of those three vectors, like a length times width times height. Now, the particular multiplication that will do what we want to do is shown here. The textbook, I think, has an error in the formula, so you could ignore that formula or just amend the formula. The formula for the volume of, of a what's called a parallel pipe, in, it's like a parallelogram in 3D, is given by u cross v, so you take any of the two sides, cross them, and then dot that result with the third side. The cross product creates a vector. The dot product creates a number. You still need absolute values around the entire thing because this process could initially give you a negative value. You cannot have negative volumes, so the absolute value takes care of that. We'll see how the formula works for an example. This example is more directed than usual. Uh, you're explicitly told which directed line segments to use to construct the, to, you know, you construct the direct line segments, imagine translating them to the origin to, to create vectors. Well, it's telling you which ones to make. And in most questions, you're not told. You're just given the points, A, B, C, and D, and said, and told, okay, go ahead. Notice in the construction of these directed line segments, each of them contains the point A. It's going from A to B, A to C, and A to D, and I'll tell you why. Look at this picture. If A is down here, what we're guaranteeing by anchoring all three directed line segments with one point at A is we're guaranteeing that we're not going to create parallel vectors. We're not going to create a vector U and another vector over here, u, and then put them both in the cross product, our cross product will end up being zero, or use one for the dot product, the other one for the cross product, we're still gonna get zero, if you think, and think about why, we end up calculating a volume of zero if we don't construct these directed line segments correctly. Anchoring all three, if we're talking about a volume, or anchoring both, if we're talking about an area, at one point, at one of the corners, that will make sure that any vectors you create are not parallel to each other. As long as the shape isn't wonky and like all the points are on a line and the person making the question messed everything up. Anyway, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's do that procedure. We're to construct the directed line segment AB is equal to B minus A. So two, one, three minus 1, 0, 1, and we get 1, 1, 2 for that first directed line segment. Now I'm going to calculate the directed line segment AC. So that's C minus A, 1, negative 1, 2. I'm just worried I'm going to miscopy these or not subtract properly. 
So 0, negative 1, 1. Now we calculate the last one. We're going from A to D, so D minus A. We have 3, 2, 9 minus 1, 0, 1. Okay, so 2, 2, 8. So those are our directed line segments. Now we imagine translating them to the origin. So just the, the um, beginning of the vectors now at the point 0, 0, 0. The components are going to be the same as what's here for the directed line segments. So that means we'll have u equals 1, 1, 2. We'll have v equals 0, negative 1, 1. And w equals 2, 2, 8. So vectors from translated line segments. directed line segments. Okay, now we can use the formula. So that was step one, now step two, volume formula. Notice that I just called the first one u, the second one v, and the third one w. I could have named them differently. I could have called the first one W, the second one U, and the third one V, named them completely, completely different than what's here. What do you think would happen if we changed the names, if we changed the letters that are there? Well, what do you think will happen in the formula? Are we going to get a different answer because one of them is called something different now? No, we're not going to get something different. Now, we might get different intermediate steps. We would get a different cross product. We might even get a different dot product as the second and last step. We might get a negative instead of a positive. But when we do the entire process, do the cross, do the dot, and take the absolute values, this formula won't care which vector is called which label. So we could also write this as, or absolute value of u cross w dot v, etc cross two of them, dot with the third. It'll always work out as long as you do the cross properly, you do the dot properly, and you take that absolute value. Okay, so let's keep going. Our volume formula, volume equals absolute value of, I'll do it the way the formula is written, u cross v dot w. So let's get that vector u cross v. I'll put in w here in anticipation of getting that vector 228. There is a strategy that you can follow. If you're looking at, the th at, 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 let's say, the three vectors and you're trying to decide which two to cross, look at the vectors with the smaller numbers in them. So I wouldn't, in I wouldn't involve w in the cross product because it's got larger numbers, 2, 2, and, and, and that 8, where the other two have smaller numbers. So it's just less likely to make a mistake. It's easier to do dot products with large numbers and cross products with large numbers because in the cross product, the multiplication involving each number happens twice and the dot product only happens once. Just a little bit of a computational um, consideration to, to, to keep in mind. Okay, so the cross product. We get these vectors down. One, one, two. So this is for u cross v. So one one two oh don't go over there stay here one one two one one two and then zero negative one one zero negative one one hide the first and the last and then we're gonna have three components let's do the down products one times one two times zero 1 times negative 1, and then subtract all the up components. Subtract, subtract, subtract. Up component, 
subtract negative 2, up component subtract 1, up component subtract 0, and then simplify. So 1 subtract negative 2 is 1 plus 2, which is 3. 0 minus 1 is negative 1, and negative 1 minus 0 is negative 1. So I'm going to take that and transplant that in for u cross v on the left-hand side. 3, negative 1, negative 1. Okay, now we can do that dot product. So absolute value of 3 times 2 is 6, and then negative 1 times 2 minus 2, and negative 1 times 8 minus 8. So we have absolute value of negative 4. It's a good thing we have those absolute values there, because if we didn't have them, we would say the volume was negative 4 negative four liters of popcorn, negative four gallons of water. Doesn't make any sense. You can't have a negative volume, usually. Equals four. Sorry, it's, it's, when I do that usually thing, it's, there's weird stuff in physics sometimes, and negative masses and stuff, and negative pressure. And... Okay, so that, that's our answer. The volume of this shape is four. And whatever the units are. And we won't talk about units. Okay, so that's it for the lesson. What's left is for you to do. You have your homework from the textbook. You have this homework, which is harder. It's a practice quiz, like the practice quiz for, for section 1.2. You don't have to post these online. I know, that, I know that about a quarter to a third of the class has already done so for the first homework, and I still have to look at those. So I'm gonna go through the, the, the ones from my section. We posted solutions. If you, there's an owl tab that says something like practice material and, and homework solutions. If you click on that and go to the bottom, you'll see uh, full solutions for all the problems that were assigned earlier. Um, anything here worth giving you a heads up about? I think we're going to add two more questions to the owl forms. There's two more that I think are, are good problems to, to supplement with these. So be on the lookout for those. We'll add them. Um, some of these, like the ones at the bottom, the extra questions that say they're, they're not required, they're, they're something to try if you're interested, some of them are actually okay, they're not that bad. Um, like number three, if you remember a little bit about your trigonometry from high school, it's a really simple question. If you don't remember that, then it's a really hard question. Number four and five aren't that bad. Um, you have to know some stuff about factoring, quadratics working with quadratics which we haven't reviewed that's why this isn't part of well we did a little bit but it's not really uh, it's not a required part of the homework let me see what else is worth mentioning let's see any typos yeah some of them are tricky if you get stuck or you want you want help post to the L forms that's the easiest way um, or if there are office hours I think I'm, gonna have, I'm having office hours next week. You can drop into those. There'll be a tab on ALT. It's hidden right now. It's something like synchronous activities. You can, if you click on that, it'll give you a, a, a directions for office hours, how to get to it. I'm using Discord next week for my office hours. We'll see how that goes. Anyway, see you next time.